Okay, hello and welcome to EAST 418A. This is lecture nine and today I've got a guest lecturer, Dr. Gord McKenna, who has uh, nicely agreed to come and talk to us about how to write a technical report. And Gord is a real master in his field, which is landform design in my enclosure. Gord's got a bachelor's of applied science in geological engineering from the University of British Columbia and a PhD in geological engineering from the University of Alberta. And Gord's been a landform designer and here for over 30 years. He's worked in consulting and academia. He's an adjunct professor at the U of A. And a few years ago, he formed his own company, McKenna Geotechnical, as well as forming the Landform Design Institute. So I'm really happy to have Gord here with me today. Thank you, Gord, for joining me. Thanks, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and your students about uh, technical writing. And in particular, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, doing technical reports. I've been fortunate to have written probably about 500 technical reports, um, some good, some bad, uh, hopefully better as I, I got older. It's difficult to learn to write and this course is a real shot in the arm for your students. And to be able well, to we all start by writing bad reports and that's how we learn. So you yeah, can't and become a good report writer unless you've written some bad ones and had some useful feedback, I think. Yeah. And, and you almost have to write every sentence 10 times before you get good at writing your kinds of things. And so anyway, that's covered by a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the rest of your lectures and that and, and talks. We're going to focus uh, specifically today on how to write a technical report. Thank you very much, Jerry, for, for introducing uh, me and giving me this chance to talk to your students. I, uh, uh, as a, a senior engineer uh, and your students will reach the point of senior engineer or senior scientist or senior manager in your in their uh, careers, you end up spending about half of your time writing. And so it's really good that the, you're taking this course now uh, through, the, through UBC here uh, and getting a good head start on the writing. Purpose uh, of the course is listed here mostly just to touch base on the lecture objective as we go through is to provide an, an overview and techniques for writing a technical report. Uh, I'm gonna share some techniques and insights I've picked up over the years. I've been fortunate to teach about 50 people, uh, mentoring them on writing and, and that, and, and much of this information we're presenting in the lecture comes from uh, those interactions. Our agenda today is, is mostly just to follow through the structure of a typical technical report and discuss the details as we go. I've added some square boxes to the lectures here, to the slides, um, uh, with a little bit of insight, remind me to tell you that in this case, often your profession or organization will have a preferred outline and format. Um, I'm presenting you one that, that works really well for engineering things, you'll find it works uh, for, for very many things, but you'll adapt it to, to meet your own needs. If you're working for a big company, they probably will insist that you use their format. You'll find that it's probably similar. There's um, take home messages here, uh, right at the beginning, a uh, couple slides. One is before you start writing, before you get into your report is make sure that you understand, um, the purpose of what you're doing, and it seems obvious to say so, but oftentimes we just launch into Word and we fire it up and we start typing and we don't really understand why we're writing or who we're writing for. Uh, and that makes your writing blurry and difficult to follow and, and a lot more work. So spending a couple moments before you start, who are you writing for and, and what is the purpose of this? Is it a government submission? Is it documenting work that you've done? Is it to try and change your boss's mind in something? And be really clear why you're doing it. A useful format that I found over the years and often teach is that uh, going back to like a grade eight laboratory report uh, or a, a first year chemistry laboratory report is a really useful way of writing a technical report. And, and we'll focus on that. Um, over the next few minutes. I'm, I'm suggesting that you really work at telling a compelling story. This is not just spitting out facts or, or that. You, you want to make an entertaining case that convinces your reader that you know what you're doing and that, you, um, and that you're going to build up your case. You're going to provide some introductory stuff. You're going to show what you did and, and what you've concluded. And that way you're communicating clearly and uh, uh, you're gaining the reader's trust. 
want you to practice writing at every opportunity. It takes about 10 years to learn to really write well. Um, you often have to write each sentence about 10 times before you really nail how to write that kind of sentence. Um, and, uh, and so you'll build up on that years. So volunteer to be the lead author, volunteer to write sections, get in there. Always get good review. We don't want to be firing stuff out that no one else has looked at. Uh, you can do that through peer review or, or if you're in, a, say, an engineering or scientific office, there'll be a formal review process. You want to review early, review often. Uh, and having an editor is a good idea. I've been really fortunate uh, to have editors, um, contract editors in my case, two different ones over my career. And right now, David Walenko out of Ottawa uh, edits all of my work and, and is also teaching me how to write at the same time, even after doing this for 30 years. Remember this for your report, and I, I've just been working on a report recently as an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta on brewing coffee to demonstrate and developing teaching tools about how water flows through soil. And so I thought, oh, here's a chance uh, uh, to produce a pretty cool report and a bunch of slides. And so I put some extra effort into the photos. I'll show you here in a moment. Um, but remember when all is said and done, all the work you've done with the client, all the meetings you've had, all the discussions, all the good work in the lab or the field, um, it's kind of water under the bridge. You're going to be judged by the report that you produce. It's the permanent record. It's what gets submitted to the regulator. It's what circulates through your company. It might circulate outside your company. And they'll see your name on the front page and you will be judged on how well you did, not, not whether you were on time for all the meetings or whether you met the budget or all these things. It comes down to the report. And in many cases, you're liable for what you write in your report. Uh, and so sometimes you'll have a lawyer review what's in there, but, but more often you're just getting that external review and make sure that the things you're saying are well supported. Every report adds or subtracts from reputation. So if you fire something out that's half-baked early in your career, it could come back to haunt you. But instead, if you make sure that everyone is really good, then you can draw upon those reports the whole rest of your career as well. You wanna craft your work to make a good report in terms of beginning with the end in mind. That's what brings us back to these, these photos here. So as, as we were uh, doing the work in the lab, I brought my camera and lights and stuff and we took a bunch of cool pictures. When I, we ground some coffee in, in, the, uh, in the store. So I took a picture of the grinder thinking, hey, I could probably re really use a good picture of the grinder coming out there at the top. Um, took thousands of pictures of the columns as the water worked through them and we only used one or two in the end. Um, and I thought, oh, we're gonna have some foreign students here that might not brew coffee or might brew them differently or might prefer tea. So I made sure I had some pictures of what it looked like to, to brew coffee to make sense. It's easier to do those as you go, thinking about what's going to be in the report um, than, uh, than waiting till the end. So a, a different example uh, to think about as we talk about re report writing here, uh, and I'll just set this up for you that uh, about 20 years ago, I had a very cool research project to drill holes in a, in a sulfur block. These are kind of the size of several football fields and contain elemental sulfur that comes out of uh, oil and gas. Um, and had to write a report on, on what we found, a site investigation report. This is quite common for geologists and, and engineers to do. And so uh, as we go through, we can think about uh, this drilling and test pitting and percolation testing and different things like that we did for the geology uh, underneath the block and the and the uh, and treating the this you know millions of tons of sulfur as a geologic material and so you know you might say well what is a sulfur block we better have that in in our report in the introduction what is the scope of work are we drilling one block ten blocks is it a big deal or a small deal uh, how deep are we drilling those kinds of things Things. What are the questions that we were trying to answer about the sulfur? So those would go into the introduction. How was the site investigated investigation conducted? That's part of your method. What were the results? What do the results mean? That goes into your discussion. What did we conclude? And what are we recommending? And then, you know, all this data we generated, where is that data? It turns out it's in the appendix. So 
as we think about technical report writing, you might think about a salt site investigation program, maybe one as cool as this uh, sulfur work we did way back when. So my standard report outline that I use as a start for all of my work in the and sets out this lecture. It's based on lab reports from grade eight. I really struggled back in grade eight to write good lab reports. And uh, I can't, you know, there are 30 of us in the class. I can't imagine the teacher now, as I think back, going through and editing all ours, trying to turn us into, into scientists. And, and uh, it was very frustrating at the time, but I'm grateful now. Um, the, typically what I produce, I have an executive summary. We have an introduction of methods, results, discussion, onto a summary, onto the conclusions, and, and then some recommendations. We'll talk about the appendices and some other things in a few minutes. Um, each outline that you do will be uh, uh, different, modified to suit the need of the reader, the shape of the project, and in your own writing style, how you want to do it. Um, and oftentimes, if like if you're writing for a journal or something, they will have an outline that's uh, preferred and is fairly similar to this. So before we start, write out the main idea, the purpose, the key point. Um, if you, the little box says there, I made up a number, it, take the time to prepare before you dive in. Every minute of preparation saves 10 minutes at the end. Might even save you hours and hours. So we're spending some time. Ask who is the audience? And I'm, I'm guessing that's the theme of all these lectures. And what do they need? What is it that they need uh, you to communicate? And then think about how you're going to build your case, the build the report up to support your conclusions and your recommendations. Write out your table of contents. Um, and oftentimes we kind of promise or think that that's kind of fixed now that, you know, that once we get our table of contents, all we have to do is write to it and fill in all the lines. I find as I'm building the case that my table of contents always changes and, and morphs around. So uh, be ready for that. Compile the information you need to write the report. So even before you start then that you've got your figures and tables and that uh, uh, ideally they'd all be done. Again, they'll also morph and change as you go through, but making sure you get through. You might decide to start writing the first half of the report before the work's even done. And that can be done as well. Set a, a review process in detail. It turns out as we proof our own work, we skip over stuff or we, we have gaps in logic or we're missing typos and that, you know, get, get that review process uh, set out. Ideally, your reviewer would see the, re the report outline and agree with you or, or add some things to it. And then as you uh, work your way along, you keep them posted and then there's no surprises at the end when it's time for them to review at the last minute. One of my professors at the University of Alberta, Dave Siegel here says, write to the figures. So one strategy that I haven't found worked as well, but it works really well for him and I pass on to you, is to make up, say he's writing a paper in a technical journal, he would make the eight figures that he needs to go into that. And then he would just craft his words around those figures and explain the figures. And uh, there's, uh, if you can do it, that's a nice way to go. So the, usually the first thing we find in a, in a report is the executive summary. And this is usually written last. So I thought, well, why don't we cover this last and we'll come back to it. It's a bit of an art to write. Your introduction, and this is where oftentimes you have to change things up as you go to write your report. Um, the, the kinds of, of areas that I start with though is a project description in the background and what does the reader need to know to understand the rest of your report. So in that sulfur block thing is like, well, this is in Fort McMurray and the sulfur is made this way and there's a paragraph for two. What is it that we were trying to do with the program? We we're trying to figure out how to bury that sulfur that could be done safely like a landfill. Um, and uh, why are we doing this and what's up? So the purpose in particular then, uh, what is the purpose of the report was to describe our drilling program and, and the questions that we we're trying to answer. Um, the scope of work um, is really critical and, uh, and it's always featured at the beginning of such a report, especially a consultant's report. What is it that you were charged to do? What are you being paid to do? What is the project um, uh, there and then what we'll see is we'll you know come at the end and like have you achieved the scope of work that you said to do. Include what the reader needs to know and understand the project. 
Uh, and the caveat is don't put stuff in there that the reader doesn't need to know. You know, it might have been that you were out there drilling one day and there was the mother of all rainstorms and you got cold and someone tripped and had to go to the hospital or different things. And it's like, oh, those are really cool things, but we don't need them to clutter up the report. Um, oftentimes in the beginning here, you'll also have some administrative details. And it's like if you're working for, for Sally Jones, you might write her name right into the report. So someone from the, the client says, oh, you know, Gord did his work. Who, who the heck was he working for? Who can I, I contact in my organization to find out who did the work? Um, uh, so you can have their name, you can have the contract number that you're working under, the purchase order number, the dates you started and things like that. Just nice to you know, cram it all in one paragraph, just so you have it. And then if you're ever looking for a purchase order number on something that you did, it's always in that area. And then they also know what project you were working on for their own point. Uh, some of this work in the um, introduction be, can be cut and pasted from the proposal or the budget or whatever you might have written before, before you started the work, before you got to go ahead. Um, and when you're writing those proposals or, or job plans or that, if you're keeping in mind that you ought to be able to cut and paste those and put them into your, into your final report, so much the better. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Richard Dawson would say, if I only have a few minutes, is down in the bottom green box in the, the slide, if I only have a few minutes to review a report, I look at what was promised in the scope of work and what were the, we recommended in the end. And that's kind of a nice way of bookending these things. So what is it that you're promising? And then you'll tie it all together with your, your discussion, your conclusions, your recommendations. Uh, the scope of work is also an opportunity to kind of lay out what's covered in the report. It's kind of, it's part of your introduction. Um, you may decide to include an area of work excluded. And so, you know, when we were drilling the sulfur pile, we weren't drilling all the sulfur piles. We weren't drilling across the street. We weren't doing um, geophysical work. You know, there, there's things that you might, might expect to be done and, and exclude or just kind of, it's kind of a, a literary technique just to make sure that, uh, give you a chance to say what you worked on or didn't work on. Um, and the last bit there, avoid details that aren't necessarily for the reader's understanding of the report. And, and I'll pick on one of the junior engineers I was working with and, and he really wanted to write, you know, we're doing something about the climate of a site and he really wanted to write a whole page on this great big storm that came uh, and he personally experienced, but it kind of had nothing, you know, that's weather, that's not climate. It, it wasn't important to understanding the rest of the report. In fact, it, it kind of got in the way and the, the reader would get to the end and say, well, how come Dylan told us this whole story of this major storm? Why was that important? Anyway, we pulled it and uh, he saved it for another day. Okay, moving on to the methods section then. Um, you're gonna lay out this again, like a lab program, lay out what was done in enough detail that someone could duplicate your work. In a case of a paper or a very technical report from the lab, it might be excruciating detail exactly what was done. Um, so that, you know, someone could try and recreate cold fusion for themselves in the lab. Uh, in our case, we, we might say, well, we drilled 19 holes in the sulfur block. We use this kind of rig from this kind of company. We use this size of drill bit and that, and, and the whole thing might actually fit in just a page in that um, so that you can just explain what you did. You're trying not to bring in the, this notion of what the results were. You're just setting out what your methods were. You might organize it by tasks or phases. You know, task one was to, um, was to do the design of the program. Task two was actually to drill in the field. Task three was the laboratory work. You, know, you can split it up like that, whatever's gonna make it easiest to explain. Um, you may wish to include mention of work that's not covered in the rest of the report. So you might say, oh, we did, uh, we did a bunch of testing uh, of this regard and, and chose not to include it in this report. It's covered on some other report. Um, it's usually the methods are concise and uh, if you need to get into more detail, they can be in an external reference. You might say we followed ASTM D792 to do this, uh, or we might say that the detailed work uh, is listed in the appendix. 
the little bit in the box says is one of my soapbox pet peeves. You find as older people, it, we all have our different ways of writing and different things that, that we like or don't like. And I don't like when we say methodology, which to me means, means the study of methods. Uh, which is not what the purpose of this section is. So I always insist that it says methods. Uh, some of the writers I work with insist that it should be methodology and then that's their choice if I'm the editor. All right, so far we've got just facts. We're separating facts from opinion um, and we're gonna continue this. We've got our facts of our, how we did it and now the facts of the results. What did we learn? What were the results of all this good work? It, you know, it might be a literature review that we've done. It might be this drilling program we've been talking about. It might be this lab work, brewing coffee and stuff. Um, what did we learn from the work? Just the facts, keep it clean. It's structured to build your case. So you might have done 10 things in a certain order, but you might change the order that you write it up so that it builds up your case on what you did. Um, Ideally, it would follow the same order as what you set out in your method section. So if you had four tasks in your method section uh, and each of them produced results, then you would want to have the same order listed here. It might be different than you did it, but at least the same order. And this sort of way of having the same order in different parts of it saves your, uh, your uh, readers from going through mental gymnastics if you don't discuss task two ahead of task one kind of thing. Um, the facts in these results says in the box should be enduring and the interpretation and opinions can change, but the fact should remain the same. In fact, the fact should be, you know, if you came back to Galileo's work 400 years later, you, the fact should still be the facts. The interpretations may or may not change. The next section is uh, the discussion section, and this gives you a chance to discuss what the results mean. And so now you're bringing in opinion and interpretation into it. Uh, it's a chance you can comment on the results and you can even um, uh, speculate in some areas and, and you know, bring in some additional ideas or stuff in here. Uh, these things may change as more data becomes available over time, but uh, that's why we've separated our facts from opinions. And we're still building our argument. The whole time we're telling a story, you know, and this is our chance now in the discussion to bring all these different pieces together. There's a summary section typically then, uh, and this one I always kind of struggle with um, because we got the executive summary that we're going to discuss in a minute. Now we got another summary and sometimes the results are kind of a summary. And so uh, the summary section is a little bit tricky, uh, at least for me, maybe not for you. It's a chance to address the scope of work and then the results that have come out of it in the discussion, trying to again, keep them in the same uh, order. If you're a purist and if you're writing for a journal in particular and scientists, they says there's no new information that can come from a summary. You can only summarize stuff you've already presented. But I'm a bit of a, a renegade and I'd say, hey, here's sometimes a chance to argument the story and bring in some, some uh, new information as we go on. It, this really troubles some people, but it makes it more entertaining and a bit more sport. Can then I just jump in for a sec there, Gord? Please do. It's, it's a great point. So I'm, I'm definitely in the purist camp there. I would get yes. to introduce new information in the summary, but I do want to use this as sort of an example of how Technical writing, although we do have a lot of rules, we also do have flexibility. And I try and raise the point a few times throughout this course that even though this is actually a science course, it's listed in this, as a science course, it's not like we're doing math or thermodynamics here where, the, where everything is a law. Virtually everything in technical writing, and all, I guess all forms of writing, but technical writing in particular, we've got a set of rules that we try and follow, but we need to break those rules or we need to have some flexibility to tell our story and to give the information that works, as you've mentioned a few times already, for the audience, for, this, for the work that we're doing. We need to actually use the document for our purposes and for our clients or our readers' purposes, not to follow some strict set of rules. Right, and if your reader, you know, if your reader is the editor of a journal, they will trounce you if you're introducing new information in the summary. If you're writing 
um, a literature review for your boss and, and, and you can enlighten them in the summary with something else, maybe you'll break that rule. You'll break it intentionally if you do. Um, yes. But again, yeah, if it makes sense, then do it. Then do it. So then your conclusions are, are like your laboratory conclusions, and, and these should be fairly short and, and hard-hitting conclusions, and they're based on, you know, what was set out in the scope of work, and, and, you know, you were asked to figure something out, and what have you figured out, what have you concluded? It's based on the results, and, and it's as organized in the discussion, so this is a chance to really hammer it at the end. Now, the, for engineering reports, you're typically making a recommendation, you know, that the design should go ahead as designed or that, that the company should install some pumping wells here or there, or that, that they should adopt the, the plan that they were doing or not adopt the plan that they were planning on. And so I've got a formula that uh, Dr. Dawson, we talked about, taught me 20 years ago, and this really works. I encourage you to use it. And it would say, if I was writing a McKenna Geotechnical report, I would write, you know, recommendations would be, you know, section six or whatever we're at here and say, um, MGI recommends that, and then whoever you're writing to, the ABC Mining Company or whoever, and then you go action verb and a sentence and a, another action verb and a sentence. So the example down at the bottom, you know, for you guys, uh, you're my audience today, Gord recommends that the students in this course and here's our action verb, practice writing at every opportunity. Start with the report summary format, um, uh, or the report format that we're talking about, and then adapt as needed. Find a good editor, establish the review process right up front. And so this is formulaic, uh, but it really works. And if you're, you might guess what the recommendations are even before you start writing, but in the end they need to flow. And what I find most young writers want to do, and many of my colleagues who are also in their 50s want to do, is kind of use flowery languages or, or preface everything. And this just, just, you know, I use this action verb thing to stop myself from doing that. So I've given you an example of, of the kinds of things that someone might write that I don't like. And it says, since global warming is, the recommendation is, since global warming is nigh and your company wants to be a leader, you should consider adopting plans that will improve your performance. You know, and you end up with this, who knows what. Uh, and it's really tempting to put in these prefaces, but this formulaic thing really works and, and it forms a checklist of what the mining needs to do. You know, did you do recommendation number seven? You know, that, that you are going to reduce global, you know, adopt practices to reduce your impact on global warming. That's kind of better language to me. So I, you can go on the internet and find hundreds or hundreds of pages with hundreds of action item verbs. If you're struggling for a verb, I've given you some action verbs down the side to build stuff or compile stuff, or sometimes you can temporalize and say, you know, consider doing this or that. Um, but they're directing the client what to do. Uh, the little cartoon in the bottom that Daryl's drawn, you know, construction season starts May 1st. So you, you say um, your, your action verb could be be ready to start construction on May 1st or ensure construction is ready to go on May 1st, these kinds of things. Any comment from you, Jerry, then as we... I'll just comment that you're, you're driving home a few points that we've been making along in this course. So in your, uh, your list here, so we've covered parallel structure or parallel construction, and I've tried to emphasize exactly what you said there. So I like the examples you've given a lot. And as well, when, you've, when you're saying some action verbs, we've referred to them as strong verbs rather than weak verbs. So I okay, yeah. appreciate your examples here. It's, it's really yeah, good. well with what we've gone over in sort of the basics, so. Yeah, excellent. So let's just cover off a couple other things uh, about the report that you're putting together. Uh, the first is your title and your title page. And it's, these are often poorly done, turns out. So think about what your title is. It really has to cover so that someone understands what's in the report just based on the title. I'm always thinking of these as kind of keywords as well for searches. I'm 
thinking about how they're going to appear when it gets uh, put into a bibliography. Um, sometimes people use a bunch of colons and different things and they'll put the company name here and there and it gets really hard to cite. So, you know, make sure that you've got a really clear title. Sometimes they end up being fairly long and that's okay. Um, make sure you put the date on the front. You'd be surprised how many reports don't have dates on the front or you're searching through them. Um, you often put who it's prepared for. You should have your name on the front. Sometimes the name is the company name, but having the author's name and you're taking responsibility. And then when, and this goes for presentations, other things, you, you get a hold of a presentation 10 years later and it doesn't have who presented it or who wrote it. And you don't know who to go and talk to. You know, are they still alive? Are they still working for the company? Are they still with the university? Whatever. So having a really good title page, oftentimes this is your brand, but oftentimes this is the only thing people see. And so, Oftentimes, uh, companies, organizations have a very strict format for what goes on. My own personal thing, I always try to have a picture on the front, um, but that's just me. Um, anyway, it's part of your brand. Let's make it clear. Sometimes there's a cover letter. Uh, it's a few pages that gets inserted, uh, gets bound up within the report or within the PDF. That's a matter of style. Um, most reports will have a table of contents. Um, and this is... There's a bunch of different thinking. Most people just use the Microsoft Word of making table of contents and they end up with three or four pages and all the subheadings are in there. And, and you know, is, it helps you find stuff later in the report, but is that really useful or not? So I, sometimes I don't have a table of contents if it's a short report. Uh, what I'll very often do is just have the chapter titles and have eight or nine things in a, in a report. So anyway, craft the table of contents to support what you're trying to say. The, it is a way, used well, it says in one of the boxes there, that uh, the index is a way of laying out the story from the beginning so people can get an idea of the structure of the report right then. I often don't like when we write, you know, chapter one is about this and goes on to chapter two and it's about that. It's, it's kind of boring unless you're trying to make the story. Sometimes your table of contents can do that. I usually try and keep it to one page and, and avoid those sub subsections. Um, a lot of reports, and especially corporate reports, will have a list of figures, list of tables, list of plates, list of appendices up the front. I, I find that really clutters things. It's one in a hundred years that I actually go looking for a specific figure and go to that and then find it on page 72 or whatever. Um, but again, that's a matter of style. Sometimes, you know, for really big reports, you'll need those. Um, I've got list of plates. I usually, it's kind of old fashioned, but I usually uh, like to keep my photos separate for my figures, but it depends on what's going to be easiest for the reader. Um, I almost always include a list of appendices and, I, and it kind of assures the reader as they're going through of, of uh, you know, they glance at it and they say, oh yeah, they got, Gord's got five appendices here and oh, I see he's got all his lab data in appendix four. Okay, I'm, I'm, or appendix D for Delta. Uh, I, I'm not gonna be looking for that in the main report. So these are just various titles. There's some other bits in here on uh, references. Having a good reference list, of course, is really important. Uh, the structure of those, I've got my own style. Actually, I have my own style guide that I made up uh, that guides me so I, I can remember um, how I do these kinds of references, how I uh, show the citations, whether there's commas or periods or what. Usually if you're writing for a journal and that, they will have their own. You can buy software. There's half dozen softwares to keep track of uh, all your references and can format them any which way. I use EndNote from time to time, but more recently I just have one huge file in Word that's got all my references. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's we're, we're using Zotero in this course. Oh, okay. It's nice when, if you invest in it and, and keep it up to date, it's quite a bit of work. Um, but if you're writing these, then you're always drawing from them. Um, and start, start populating it early. I started when I was probably 40 years old, which is yeah. still extraordinarily helpful compared to not having one at all. But I, I cringe at the number hundreds if not thousands of hours I've spent adding references, reformatting references for a different style, going back and copying and pasting most of the time yep. from a previous report to grab a reference rather than retype it. It's yep. a exactly. lot of time. And, and I just got caught recently 
um, where we were working on a report. We didn't have all the references nailed. The report got sidelined for a year and then we came back and then it was trying to find, you know, it says Alberta government 2012. You're trying to remember, oh, what one did we mean for that? And, and you're looking online and oh boy. So don't take shortcuts as you go. Keep your file going as you're writing. And, and what I do may be helpful to you, especially your big reports. I have a special file called refs refs for the tailings report or something and i just leave it open the whole time on a second screen and then i'm always dumping stuff in or taking stuff out of that uh, as i go through uh, and then in the end it just gets beamed to the to the last page of your report um, before you issue your report you need to there's a check here to go through and double check that that you have all the references that you've cited and that there's no extraneous references. And, and there's probably ways, software ways you can do this, but I find I usually just end up printing it out and I just highlight every citation and, I, and then I go and, and open up my file that's got all the references in it uh, on the other screen and I just go through one by one by one and just make sure. And there's always a couple missing and there's always a couple that I never did use or have no longer used in that report and those come out. And then once those are all cleaned up, then I copy them back into, into my big database. Um, you'll want, you'll, your organization that you're working with at a given time will typically have its own style for references. A lot of engineering companies, geotechnical companies I work for, we follow the Canadian Geotechnical Society journal, Canadian Geotechnical Journal references kind of thing, for instance. And, uh, uh, and that's a fairly kind of common thing to do. Uh, I like less punctuation than more. And so you'll see in these examples here that I've, I've uh, tried to cut down on the amount of punctuation and commas and everything else um, for my own personal writing style. When you have your own company, you get to choose your own style. Um, yeah, getting towards the end here. Your appendices includes data that supports the work, but is not crucial to its understanding. Um, and so if you have really big tables, they can go back in there, report, scopes of work, different things. A variety of information ends up uh, in those. It's important, but less critical to the understanding. Um, and sometimes, kind of a consulting trick, sometimes we don't put as much, many hours into formatting and, and being as critical about, uh, other than for accuracy, but being as critical about what's in an appendix. Um, they're generally organized in the order that you cite them. So Appendix A comes first, and you might have had on page three in the main text, and then you might mention Appendix B on the on seventh page or whatever. Uh, but then it becomes, if there's kind of a more logical way to orient your appendices, then you might change how you write your report or your text in there. Uh, a consulting trick is that is that your chapters or your sections are labeled chapter one, two, three, and four, and your appendices are often labeled A, B, C, D. And then you can refer to table B7 that, that the reader then knows is in the appendix. Um, oftentimes for hard copies, the consultant will have, or the organization will have a whole bunch of hard tabs made up, the appendix A, appendix B, and that. So, um, so I never use appendix one, two, three. I always use A, B, C. Minor point, but... Uh, uh, kind of useful. Um, last little bits on uh, figures, tables, and plates. And this is part of your technical communication course that you're, you're giving in here. But you really want to make your uh, figures, tables, and plates easy to read. You're thinking about the size. You want them to all look fairly similar, hanging together, so it doesn't look like a ransom note when you're done at the end. Uh, you want to have pictures uh, uh, showing the coffee brewing pictures that we're doing in the lab here. Uh, and you want to get really good pictures if you can. And, and ideally pictures that show uh, the whole, if you only ever got to show one picture, that you've got one really good one that's uh, clear and well taken. Uh, the pictures and the tables are, are often, the, and the figures are often the heart of the report. Oftentimes as I'm reading reports, I mostly am looking at the figures. Um, you don't. You only want to include figures that are necessary to tell the story. Um, pay attention to formatting, like we discussed, and and uh, uh, 
making sure that they're perfect. Um, and, and kind of a note with the table, you'll find in some reports that it's easiest to communicate uh, most of the information you learn just in tables, often 11 by 17 tables. You have to think nowadays how they'll fit on the screen in that uh, for people just using PDFs. Um, but it can be really useful to, to organize the, the results in that uh, in large tables, even if they're mostly text. Some people hate that. Some people really want prose. They don't even like bullet points. And the idea of putting a whole bunch of prose into uh, tables kills them. Uh, but it depends on the job and depends on the reader and depends on the writer. And maybe turn it back to you, Jerry, for a moment, if anything to add on that. Uh, no, I think this is all great advice. I will be doing a whole lecture on figures in a couple of weeks. So this is Excellent. an introduction. I'll, I'll come back yeah. in a bit more detail There's, on different types of figures. But. Introduction. Yeah, so in this, we're putting together this article on, on uh, uh, brewing coffee to understand how water flows through soils and instead we're using how what more people understand is water flowing through coffee and that and so in the bottom left there uh, it's sort of a table kind of a figure and I took some pictures of 200 grams of coffee and as different ways and then uh, and then put kind of the results of the data the the article is kind of a, a light-hearted um, uh, educational article and, and so it fits this kind of mode Oftentimes it comes down to in these figures, you only get to show one figure for your report. And so uh, the one on the left here shows the methods that we use. We had water coming into coffee in a column and then flowing out into a, a coffee pot, all with different scales and that. And it's labeled right on there. You can see our picture of the stopwatch we're using in that. Uh, we have a bunch of data loggers running. You can sort of see the computer there. Um, and so looking for that one picture that covers everything, Thing, or the one graph here that, that in our case two graphs that show where the water was going and as it moved through the system and, and a water balance in the bottom. And so this water balance in the bottom we decided you know right at the very beginning when we were designing the whole brewing experiment what we really wanted to do was have a water balance every second and be able to make a graph that's some to 100 percent and we could we could see if we could actually balance you know if you added up all the weights of all the water from all the scales whether we would come up to 100 percent so we we designed the program to make this figure to go into the report all right getting back last couple slides now um turning to the executive summary Writing executive summaries, I'm guessing, Jerry, you will be going through this with the, the students, but it's its own art form. Uh, and it's kind of difficult and it takes quite a lot of time to learn to write. It, if, if you think of, I'm not exactly the sure of the difference. There are formal differences between an executive summary and an abstract. Abstracts are usually quite a bit shorter, uh, but they share quite a lot of similarities. As you're writing it, you're thinking, what does the vice president need to know? There's every chance the vice president will never see your report, but who, you know, who is it who maybe isn't an expert in the area? They don't have four days to read your report. They've got 10 minutes and, and they're mostly going to go to the executive summary. In fact, it says in the box, you would expect that most people who have any contact with your report are probably only going to read the executive summary and then they'll kind of flip through the rest of it and see if you really did the work and and if there's any cool pictures so the executive summary is usually one to two pages some people have a formula it has to be one sometimes it leaks into three every now and then we work on a really big report it will have its own summary uh, there might be 20 or 30 pages uh, for people who don't want to read the 500 page report. But this executive summary is just down to one to two pages. Uh, my formula for doing this, and I, I think this is probably uh, common for most people, the first paragraph is what, what's the problem to be solved or the questions to answer. And you, you're just pulling those from your intro and your scope. How is the work done? You're just at the highest level. You know, we went out and drilled the sulfur block in August of 2020. We drilled 19 holes, it cost a million dollars, and the lab data came in by Christmas. What were the results? So highlighting what you learned. Uh, from, we learned that sulfur was hard and can catch fire and, and produces sulfuric acid, and, and that we're gonna have a heck of a time figuring out how to bury it. What do the results mean? 
means that there's more work from this or discussion or or you know what we thought was simple what wasn't or or everything's straightforward ready to go what are the major recommendations usually you have a half dozen recommendations but in the executive summary here there sometimes you could have all of them listed uh, you think of the truth and reconciliation report their executive summary is probably the 94 individual items that were mentioned in their report uh, in our case, we're usually a subset of them, just the two or three really major ones that uh, you might say the report contains nine recommendations. The three major ones that really need to be done are these. What are the next steps that the vice president ought to follow? And then sometimes in, uh, fairly often you'll have a key table, like if it comes down to one table, I was reading a dam breach analysis yesterday, and it came down to one table of if a tailings dam did breach, what areas would be covered, how big would the peak flows be, and how long would it take for the tailings to reach various uh, villages and stuff on that. So that just ends up in one key table. Sometimes there's one key figure. We look at that water balance with the coffee. That might go in the executive summary. Um, but again, it has to be easy enough for that executive to read and understand. As you're working through your report then, these are the kind of key milestones that I kind of celebrate as we go through. Uh, first, that you've got an outline, the table of contents, and, and you might think, as we discussed before, that you know once you got that, then all you have to do is fill in the paragraphs under each one, but actually it morphs with time as you learn stuff as you're writing. But once you have that first outline, that, that feels kind of good. You get your reviewer to uh, to agree to it. Sometimes you get the client to agree, to, you know, the reader who it's going to. The one I really celebrate is that first rough draft that you've got something written in every section and it halfways holds together. It's still very rough around the edges, but you at least got it done. You know, you got that that moment. You save it. You change the file name in case something happens and you lose it. This often takes three quarters of the time to get to this point but you've got your first draft, phew, celebrate. Uh, and then a good draft, uh, something that you've gone through now and it, it's something that could theoretically go to the client. It still needs review, but you can share it with your colleagues. You're, you've broken the back of it. You got it pretty much done. And there's a final draft. It's been reviewed. It's ready for the uh, reader to have it as a feedback. Sometimes you initial find, you give a final report without the client ever having seen it, but usually there's a draft involved. This has to be something, oftentimes the final report never gets done. And legally, you pretty much have to do your final report and that, but there's issues often the client doesn't give you back any feedback and months go by. And so sometimes your final draft is all that will be on the shelf. So it has to be very good. Your final report is going to be signed and sealed and delivered. And as you go through, you probably have in your schedule dates for each of these uh, activities and sort of a um, professional deal. If you know you're going to miss one of these deadlines, the moment you know that you're going to or likely to miss a deadline, you really have to let the, the client know. Sometimes we, we think, oh, I'll just take another week and, and maybe I can catch up or I can... I, can, I won't go to the client until I've got a good plan and all these things. But as soon as you know you're going to be missing something, you have to go right away. Sometimes, sometimes the deadlines can shift. Sometimes they absolutely can't shift. And so if you're struggling, you've got to keep your client informed. So now that uh, the second to last slide here, now that you've um, been given this instruction here on writing reports, I'm going to give you the charge to head out into either the rest of your class or into the world and get out there and write the best reports. Think about who the reader is and the best way to communicate to them. Have a plan for editing and review right up at the beginning rather than waiting to the last minute. Apply all these lessons that you're learning from the rest of the course into this report writing. Get good at writing and you'll be doing more and more every year of your career. It takes 10 years to become really proficient, so start today and you can learn quite a lot you know, seek out opportunities to edit other people. And one of the best ways to learn to write is reading others' work, whether it's good fiction or good engineering reports. I keep collections of reports that I've that I see that I really like and I steal from their table of contents. They call it R and D, rip off and duplicate without plagiarizing. But and learning by peer editing so you can hand stuff off to other students or to each other. And you know when a senior engineer like me gets something that's being peer reviewed by each other. It just reads so much better. There's less of my time spent uh, having to correct things. You're putting your best foot forward. 
oftentimes I'll, I'll say to someone, wow, this writing is really good. You're really improving. They say, well, Sally had a look at it or Sam had a look at it. Uh, and they help me through and I say, oh, all the better. And you're doing the same for them. And you're learning, you're learning and, and supporting each other uh, in both ways. You end up with a better product, better skills, and less time. So I put my uh, information at the back as an adjunct professor at the U of A. It's my job to help students, not just at the University of Alberta, but uh, anyone that I'm teaching like this. So please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments as, uh, as you go along. And uh, I just wish you all the best in your course and, and in your writing career. And thanks for taking this time today. Thank you so much, Gord. That was, uh, that was a really great talk. There, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, some of the things I've gone over already and you've reinforced them and a lot of new things that you've added. So I really appreciate it. Great. My pleasure. I'd like to actually just chat with you about one topic that you sort of touched on at the beginning. I'm going to use the example, I think, of your report that you had highlighted from the sulfur piles. Yes. You mentioned that writing reports is a way to learn you focused a little bit about learning to write, but I think if I read what you were saying about that report, uh, read between the lines, you also learn a lot about your technical field by writing these reports. And in a good report, it's actually a chance to sharpen your mind and sharpen your thinking, not just about how to write, but also about the technical aspects of what you're writing about. Yeah, very much so. I probably learn as much in the writing phase as I do in the site investigation phase or the design phase. Uh, and when you actually have to put something to paper that will stand up to review by your peers, it forces you to be uh, really clear in what you're thinking. And oftentimes as, as I'm writing, I realize, oh, we never did figure this out or, oh, I didn't understand that that was going to be important. And then uh, I think some of your students will know from if they've done a thesis or not. It's kind of this general tug of war in a thesis where you're starting to write and you say, oh, well, I want to be able to say this. Well, I'm going to have to go back to the literature for a week. Or I'm going to have to go back to the lab for a week and pick up some more. So it forces you to be clear, to organize your th thoughts. And I'll oftentimes I'll start writing the report early on so that I can kind of discover where uh, teach myself stuff about the, the topic and, and discover where maybe some of the work is a bit weak and we need to, to come back on. It does result in some spinning wheels and it's not as efficient as I'd like sometimes to, to start writing too early, but I usually do anyway. Uh, one of my colleagues, he says, you know, sometimes I just kind of start all over again because uh, in my writing, because then I'll discover new things I hadn't thought of the first time. That seems a little bit counterintuitive, but that was the kind of fellow he was. And there's a little bit of something to that somewhere. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, I think I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. I think we've covered a lot. We've got uh, plenty of uh, material here for the lecture. And I think maybe I will uh, stop it there unless there's anything else you wanted to add. But I, I really appreciate everything you've said and you've given us a ton of great uh, insight. Yeah, well, my pleasure and, and feel free to to copy and hand out the slides if you like. That's helpful to the students. I tried to write that with, write those slides as a permanent record. Much appreciated. I'll post a, a version of those on the internal site that we have. Great.